tonight on Primetime Politics, Canada's Fiscal Challenge. Of course, we do not always agree on everything. The finance minister meets with her provincial and territorial counterparts in Toronto, coming together to talk about health care funding and green initiatives up against tough economic times. Coming up, we will speak to Alberta's finance minister about the meeting and set the stage for next week's gathering of the first ministers in Ottawa. Also, we felt that that investigation was the right first step. Billions of dollars given out in pandemic benefits to people who did not qualify. We'll speak to Canada's Auditor General about the issue and get her reaction to the CRA's hesitance to get that money back. And... What we uh, acknowledge today uh, is there was uh, insufficient consultation. The government drops a controversial amendment from its gun bill. Will that get their signature firearm legislation passed? Will hunting rifles now be left out of future policies? This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. The federal, provincial and territorial finance ministers met today in Toronto discussing the state of the economy and the challenges presented to Canada by the United States and its Inflation Reduction Act. Now, that act provides both incentives and supports for green investments in the United States, which the federal finance minister says could lead investors to ignore Canada if Ottawa and the provinces do not respond with their own policies to transition the Canadian economy. I think we have to do whatever it takes, but not more. And that is something that we are working on very, very intensively right now. Um, that's why it was an issue that I did raise with the provincial and territorial finance ministers. And also discussed today, health care funding and fiscal constraints. So with more, we are now reaching out to Alberta's Finance Minister, Travis Taves. Mr. Taves, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, it's great to be with you. Now, I have to address the elephant in the room first and foremost. I appreciate that you're speaking to us in your car as you go to the airport. So you got to love modern technology. Uh, you know, I, I want to begin with what we heard from Krista Freeland today, really from the start of the day, as she was calling on all provinces and territories to come together to meet the challenge of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. Now, she is asking for cooperation. Uh, what's your response to that call? Well, look, Alberta is already doing a lot on that front. Uh, we've been investing in carbon capture, utilization and storage uh, infrastructure now for really decades, quite frankly. We have a, a levy on our heavy emitters in Alberta where we've been, again, collecting funds uh, from the industry and reinvesting uh, those funds in research and development on bringing emissions down. Some of the reinvestment has gone into facilities, again, always bringing emissions down. Uh, we, we really have uh, moved forward uh, on our uh, petrochemical incentive program, uh, including carbon capture and storage uh, infrastructure uh, as, part, you know, in, as part of hydrogen investment and other petrochemical investment uh, to be eligible for the incentive program. So Alberta has really stepped out and uh, we're calling on the federal government to, uh, you know, to ensure that uh, Alberta and, in fact, Canada is competitive with the U.S. around the Inflation Reduction Act. Okay, so if you say Alberta is already responding to, to the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., what then are you looking for out of Ottawa? What's an appropriate response from the federal level? Well, we, we really need uh, to ensure that we have a level, uh, level playing field with the Americans. Uh, like I say, Alberta's really stepped up. We've we've also moved forward on a regulatory basis, ensuring that uh, carbon hubs all over the province uh, have a regulatory path forward. We've assigned a number of those hubs to various proponents, and uh, and and again, we're calling on the federal government, uh, firstly, to pass the legislation around the investment tax credit related to carbon capture and storage, and to ensure that uh, Canada has a level playing field to ensure that Canada ha has business competitiveness uh, with the U.S. with regard to the Inflation Reduction Act. 
Okay. Uh, you know, I also want to talk about health care. As we talk about inflation reduction, the numbers, you know, uh, of course, the first ministers will be meeting in Ottawa on Tuesday. Uh, Minister Freeland did not give away a lot today. But she did say that we are in tight economic times. As one who controls the economic levers in Alberta, what does that say to you about what Ottawa is willing to bring to the table if she's already issuing a warning? Well, well look, as finance ministers, we're always, we always experience fiscal constraints. That's, that's our reality. It's a matter of priorities. Uh, provinces have been really carrying uh, the vast majority, in fact, virtually all of the incremental load around healthcare costs the last number of years. We've seen, you know, COVID uh, add significant cost uh, to delivering healthcare. There's no end in sight there. Looks like we're gonna be dealing with additional costs related to uh, just living with COVID in future years. And so it's high time the federal government anteed up. Uh, of course, uh, we joined other provinces and asking for a full 35% uh, of healthcare costs to be funded through the Canada Health Transfer. We're also calling for uh, the increase in the transfer to be no strings attached. Healthcare delivery is a provincial responsibility and, and the feds simply need to increase the transfer and let provinces identify the priorities and needs in, in their jurisdiction. I appreciate you're your, your, your saying that no strings should be attached. It's not the first time we've heard that from the provinces. And Ottawa continues to be clear in their call. They, they want more data. They want more accountability. So if those two sides are still making these calls at this point. Are you hopeful that there will be a deal out of Tuesday? Well, I, I'm hopeful there will be a deal. It's been a long time coming. Obviously, we'll have to evaluate the proposal when it comes. But two things, uh, province have had, provinces have been, um, you know, carrying all of the incremental financial load related to health care in the last number of years. We've seen those costs go up dramatically and they're expected to continue to climb. And, uh, you know, there are nuanced needs and pressures uh, at, you know, with various provinces and provinces have the responsibility to, to deliver. So uh, the funding needs to be no strings attached. Now, look, again, we'll be interested in the proposal and uh, we'll, we'll evaluate it when we receive it. So you are open to perhaps some of what Ottawa is calling for right now? Well, again, we'll evaluate the proposal when we receive it. But, but our position is it should be an increase in the Canada Health Transfer without strings. Minister Taves, really appreciate the time. Thank you for this. Uh, I hope you make your flight. Thank you. I hope so, too. <laughs> you take care. <laughs> Now, in that closing news conference with the finance ministers, the Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, was also asked about a high-altitude surveillance balloon launched by the Chinese government. It has been observed floating over the state of Montana and is right now being actively tracked by NORAD. Canada's intelligence agencies are working with American partners, and we continue to take all necessary measures to safeguard Canada from foreign intelligence threats. We take this very seriously. Well, let's take a look now at the other stories making headlines today, beginning with reaction to this statement made earlier this week by the Conservative leader. The Trudeau NDP approach is on open display in Vancouver. It is a complete disaster. It is hell on earth. That was Pierre Poliev earlier this week reacting to a new pilot program in British Columbia. It decriminalizes small amounts of certain illicit drugs in the hopes that it will lead to better health outcomes. Poliev is against it, but his choice of words have offended Vancouver's mayor. Ken Sim saying in a statement to the Globe and Mail, we do not support anyone using our most vulnerable residents to advance a political agenda. So my first order of business uh, with the government of Quebec, and I spoke with the mayor of Quebec yesterday and with my colleague Jean Duclos, is ready to find a, an industrial partner uh, who could take the business forward or even transform that into an R&D center. So uh, it's really about finding solutions now. Obviously, uh, we have legal recourse, uh, and the company assured us that it will respect all their commitments to the government of Quebec and the government of Canada. 
That was the industry minister responding to news. The vaccine company that received $173 million from Ottawa is shutting down. Medicago did successfully develop a COVID-19 vaccine. It was approved by Health Canada, but not the WHO. Medicago is now owned by the Mitsubishi Chemical Group, and it says the Quebec-based company will be liquidated due to low demand for their product. Well, the federal government is backing down, withdrawing controversial amendments from its signature gun bill. Now, the amendments came late in the process and were criticized by many as targeting rifles and shotguns used by hunters and farmers. The Liberals said it was about banning assault-style weapons, but now Bill C-21 will move forward without those amendments. What we uh, acknowledge today uh, is there was uh, insufficient consultation, uh, that uh, more work had to be done to hear from Indigenous communities and from Canadians uh, across the board. Uh, it is uh, absolutely critical uh, that this bill get adopted. Um, the, uh, it's important that we take handguns off our streets and assault-style weapons. And there's a couple of items that we still need to have conversations about. Meanwhile, the Conservative leader is declaring a temporary victory, while the NDP is glad to move on with the bill with its original focus on handguns. Today's humiliating climb down that we have forced Trudeau to make is a temporary pause in his, his plan to ban hunting rifles. He is doing this because he got caught and because Canadians of all walks of life from across the country, law-abiding, decent, indigenous Canadians, Farmers, rural Canadians who, who follow the law stood up with Conservatives and forced him to temporarily pause this plan. You know, I don't know uh, what reasoning the Liberals ultimately had for these amendments, but I definitely will underline the incompetence part of it. Um, when those amendments were dropped, they single-handedly derailed any kind of progress we were making on the bill. And uh, now that they are gone, we can begin to work on the more constructive elements of C-21. With their thoughts, we're now joined by our Friday journalist panel. Bob Fife is the Ottawa Bureau Chief for the Globe and Mail. Catherine Levesque is parliamentary reporter with the National Post. Nice to see both of you in studio. Yeah, thanks yeah, for absolutely. inviting us. <laughs> Happy to have you here. So listen, Catherine, I'll, I'll get you to start. You know, here you have the Liberals uh, pulling back on these amendments, but but did they really have any other choice? You know, the, the, the opposition to them built up very quickly and they crossed party lines. I mean, they, they had to do something. They had to pull it out. It was uh, becoming too much of a contentious issue. But I, they also saw the opposition growing from the Conservatives to the NDP to even the Bloc. Um, so I, I think, you know, something changed since Christmas. They saw the polls. I think they saw the numbers. The numbers are not very good for the Liberals right now. And so they had to do something to buy the peace, to kind of pull this issue out of the public sphere and to move on with their, their bill, their, uh, their their proposed bill. And uh, yeah, to, to buy the peace uh, with, with the NDP especially. Now, I, I expect the Conservatives to kind of still go on about this issue, to try to kill the bill. But ultimately, I think by they had to retrieve those uh, amendments. Uh, they didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, Bob, were the Liberals overconfident? here because yeah, as we said the these amendments came late in the game uh, did they not anticipate the pushback look they were trying to wedge the conservatives that Pierre Polyev had just become leader let's wedge them on guns because they did so effectively against uh, Andrew uh, sorry not Andrew here Aaron O'Toole in the, in the 2021 election campaign but they didn't do their homework they went after guns that are used by people who hunt, by people who are uh, farmers, and most importantly, the indigenous community who use these kind of rifles to go hunting for a variety of things. And it blew up in their faces because somebody in Ottawa who doesn't know anything about hunting or, or the indigenous life or, or the kind of guns that are used responsibly in hunting, thought, oh, let's wedge the Tories and let's put it, these guns in, and it blew up in their faces. Yes, the Tories went, went after them hard, but boy, when I saw you know, the NDP MPs from Northern Ontario, like Charlie Angus, come out and say, I'm against this, this is really bad, you knew that this was, they, they could not sustain this. So they, they, they got hosted by their own petard, if I want to say so. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're going to get back to the original intention of the legislation, which I don't think there's any disagreement, handguns. Okay, well, pick up, pick up on that point then, Catherine. Will this now 
passed quickly. Will C-21 actually get passed quickly now that these amendments are gone? I don't think so, because Mark, as Mark Collins said, I mean, they're going to be consulting now. <laughs> they're going back to the consultations. I, I, I know the opposition just before Christmas, actually, in, in the committee, they were talking about uh, consulting and actually doing a cross-country tour, uh, you know, going in northern areas, uh, going to meet with indigenous communities to actually talk about this bill. So I get the feeling that there's still going to be this consultation happening. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I do think this bill if there are no more controversial amendments, I think it's going to pass because certainly I think the NDP said they were okay with it. Now I think the bloc will also want to uh, uh, to, to support it ultimately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And which brings me to what they were trying to do with the amendments, Bob, because you know to listen to the conservative leader, uh, he says this is just a temporary reprieve. He expects the liberals to come back uh, again, warning hunters uh, and indigenous populations about. The, the amendments. So what do you make of the well, future I, of those intents? Look, I, I don't think that they're, they've learned their lesson here. They've got their fingertips burned on the stove. They're not going to bring back like a uh, uh, banning of guns that are used by people who hunt or fish or indigenous people. But there are obviously rifles uh, that are used for hunting that look like machine guns or out of Rambo. And I don't think the Tories want to defend those rifles. Good luck because people in the country take a look at some of those guns and they go, whoa, that doesn't look like a hunting rifle to me. That looks like a rifle you go into a shopping mall and kill people. So uh, they'll be successful if they bring those kind of amendments in, uh, but they just have to be really careful that there is a law-abiding uh, segment of the Canadian population that hunt and fish and they need uh, guns for if they're on farms or in remote communities or if they're indigenous, which is crucial to their life. Uh, they need those kind of weapons and they have to think that through. Okay, well, let's shift focus now and talk about Tuesday, because, of course, next Tuesday, the First Ministers will gather here in Ottawa. Uh, health care, health care funding, of course, on the table. What do you expect out of that meeting, Catherine? Are we looking at a, a wholesale deal, deal here on health care funding? Are we looking at sideline agreements? What, what do you think will come out of that meeting? I think we're going to be talking about numbers. Uh, you know that that's really the the, the, the crux of the, this whole thing right now. Um, I, I know this week the premiers came out and said we expect healthcare to be funded by 35 percent. You know that means 28 billion extra dollars every year. I don't think they're going to be getting that. <laughs> I think you know they they wish they could have that, but I don't think that's going to be happening. But we also saw the premiers uh, complain a little bit about the fact that they haven't had any proposal yet from the federal government. So I really I expect the federal government to try to come here come there with numbers to try to talk about this, but also get them to try to agree to conditions. And ultimately, I mean, I think we might actually see some separate deals with different provinces because you know right now. Now there's still this unity between the premiers, but uh, as we've seen in the past, this can quickly disappear. Yeah, well, uh, of course, in November, the, the health ministers came together that with the, the, the federal government. Nothing came of that. What's your expectation for Tuesday? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of money on the table, but all of it is not going to be part of the Canada Health Transfer. A big chunk, uh, uh, I don't know how much, but there will be a, a significant amount of money that will go to bilateral agreements because every province has particular interest. In the case of Ontario, for example, they're talking a 10-year deal um, with $70 billion on the table. Uh, some of it all the CNCH uh, kind of health transfer, but the other in terms of building long-term care facilities and home care. Every province has, you know, people in the Yukon and Northwest Territories or British Columbia have different uh, uh, medical needs. So these bilateral agreements are going to have to be negotiated. Um, but uh, there's going to be agreement. The Prime Minister is not meeting with the, with the pr First Ministers to walk away without failure. Mm -hmm. And there has been some significant concessions made from the, from the Premiers, including the Premier of Quebec, in terms of uh, uh, data modernization so that you know, doctors can access your health records or you can ha access your health records, the mental health, uh, money for mental health, there's, there's a, uh, the fact that we're going to reduce credentials. They are agreeing to reduce credentials uh, so people can, can move from one province to another mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. if they need uh, as a nurse or a doctor. So there's, there's a lot of things that are, that are going on, and, and, that, uh, and that's because Ottawa has held out a lot of money, and the provinces have started to say, okay, 
maybe we can agree to this. Yeah, that's interesting, though, because you say a lot of money, and, and that this picks up on your point, because here you do have the provinces. They want billions of dollars more, but, you know, uh, there, there are, I guess, two competing interests here for the federal government. On the one hand, how much wiggle room do they actually have fiscally, considering that uh, we heard Christian Freeland already warn that there's not a lot of money left, but what is the political price they pay if they don't cough up some money to meet the health care needs, given the crisis, uh, the different crises that we're seeing right across the country? Uh, they, they have to cough up some money. I, I think, you know, if they're going to be using any money in the next budget is going to be for health care, but also to, uh, uh, you know, for, for electric vehicles to, you know, respond to uh, the United States Inflation Reduction Act. But certainly for health care, they have to do something. But at the same time, they expect to have results uh, in the medium term, in the long term. Uh, you know, the, the federal government, I think, rightly so, doesn't want to give billions extra in money just to have premiers give that back in, in checks or, you know, in, in, in tax breaks for their citizens. So, of course, they, they have to give some money. But again, I really do not think it's going to be an extra $28 billion per year. Um, you know, Jean-Yves Duclos has already said, well, look, we're already giving some extra money. That's because it's following inflation and the current transfer uh, for, for this year. I think it's $49 billion. So that is a significant amount. But yes, I do expect some, some more money for some long-term investments and results. But there's no room for failure here. Yeah. Um, you know, well, Canadians, the Liberals campaigned on health care, right? Yeah, they, well, they distinguish it's, it's themselves on that. that. I mean, the premiers are responsible for health care. Ottawa does provide a significant amount of funding. But, the, you know, the Canadians, the health care system is on the verge of collapse here. Mm -hmm. And if they walk out of a meeting with failure, people are going to be out in the streets with pitchforks against both the federal government and the provinces. So they've got to come out of this meeting saying, we're going to fix this. It's not going to happen overnight. Clearly, it's going to take a long, uh, uh, over a period of time, but we are, we are committed to doing so. Yeah, millions of Canadians without a primary care doctor, people watching this very closely across the country, uh, right. as will we come Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> but for now, Bob Catherine, thank you for this. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Last November, the Auditor General released a report that reviewed COVID-19 support programs used by Ottawa during the early part of the pandemic. That review uncovered billions of dollars that were paid to people who did not actually qualify and billions more that this country's AG believes need further investigation. Karen Hogan appeared before the Public Accounts Committee earlier this week. There were employees in Canada Revenue Agency and Employment and Social Development Canada that were identified having received payments and there was an internal investigation that, that kicks off first. It's then up to the department and the agency whether they refer that case to law enforcement. But we felt that that investigation was the right first step. At, at the CRA, uh, we treat you know public servants as general taxpayers, and if you violate the rules, you you get suffer the compliance efforts. So I don't have numbers right in front of me, uh, not very many, obviously, and uh, I don't believe any of those cases have gone uh, into a criminal investigation. Some of our employees had availed themselves, uh, as any Canadian, uh, to apply for SIR benefits. On their own time so want to make it clear they did not use any internal systems in doing so uh, we did um, alert that up to our chief security officer and an administrative investigation uh, did uh, take place those individuals that um, did um, break the trust of the employer employee relationship as we reviewed for cause their security clearances have been terminated uh, to date we have terminated 49 individuals well, to talk about this, we're now joined by the Auditor General of Canada, Karen Hogan. Ms. Hogan, nice to see you again. Hi, nice to see you. Now, you and I talked about the issue when you released uh, your report last fall, but, uh, but I think it's probably worthwhile here to repeat because the money went out to people who did not qualify because of the criteria or, or I guess, controls that the government uh, decided to use in determining who actually could get support payment. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. So at the beginning in the design of these programs, a decision was made to align um, the government with international best practices in the time out of emergency. And very limited prepayment controls were put in place to vet the eligibility of recipients. And the understanding was then to have rigorous post-payment work in order to go back after the fact and check if people were eligible. 
When our audit looked at um, several six COVID programs, most for individuals and one for businesses, we found that $4.6 billion were paid to individuals who were not eligible. And we also highlighted another at least $27.4 billion that went to individuals and businesses that require further investigation. So that post-payment work to just verify whether or not they meet the eligibility criteria before a decision is made on should collection be followed up or not. Okay, so so billions of dollars, as we said. And you did appear uh, this week before the uh, Public Accounts Committee. Uh, you were not alone, though. Uh, other officials were there, and among them uh, was the commissioner for the Canada Revenue Agency. And he says he doesn't think it is worthwhile, uh, or worth the effort, rather, to, to go after the billions of dollars in overpayments. Uh, what do you say to that? Honestly, the decision that the commissioner or any deputy makes with how they use their resources is one that's left up to them. Um, what I highlighted here was that under under current legislation, um, every taxpayer needs to be treated fairly. And so if a taxpayer has received an amount that they're not eligible to, it should be returned to the government. In order to do that, you have to identify who's ineligible. And that means rigorous post-payment work is needed. You know, a typical support program um, has rigorous upfront checking and vetting before any payments go out to an individual. That didn't happen here. So the flip side means that you need to do that rigorous post-payment work. So I think it's needed in order to demonstrate fairness to taxpayers and in order to then be able to identify who is eligible or not and then make a decision about collection. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do want to ask you something, and, 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 and I hope this isn't too sensitive to ask you, but, you know, uh, the commissioner also questioned the methodology that was used uh, by your office to determine the numbers. Uh, what's your response to that? So I guess that there's always a different way to come up with an estimate for sure. But what we took the approach was that because there was no information at the Canada Revenue Agency on monthly revenue. So the issue was around uh, businesses being eligible. And you might recall that the main criteria for businesses um, was that they needed to demonstrate a revenue decline over an, a four week period, an eligible four week period. There is no monthly information at the Canada Revenue Agency. Nothing was collected on application. It was very much like individual programs where personal attestation or business attestation drove whether payments went out the door. So what we turned to was the only bit of revenue information at Canada, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency on a monthly basis, which is GST returns. And we used those to flag and identify businesses that didn't look like they actually had a revenue decline. And we um, tallied those up and recommended that $15.5 billion worth of payments be investigated further. Mm -hmm. So what do you hope parliamentarians take out of your testimony then? Well, I hope they see the need and encourage the Canada Revenue Agency and Employment and Social Development Canada to do most more rigorous post-payment work. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there are some you know, support programs now that have very rigorous upfront vetting and they still do a percentage of post-payment work. What we're seeing in this case, where there was limited prepayment controls, um, the departments are doing very similar amounts of post-payment work. Well, that's not rigorous post-payment verification when you had no vetting up front. So I hope that they'll find the resources and the time, because the time is running out. In some cases, there's a legislative time frame to identify these potential overpayments. So I hope they find the time and they do the extra work needed in order to treat Canadians fairly and recover any amounts that might be needed to be recovered. And what about lessons learned? You know, of course, the, the, when COVID-19 came, it was an extraordinary moment for, for the world. But going forward, is there a lesson to be taken out of all of this? I think a couple of our recommendations in our audit report really report to some of the lessons learned. I think the decisions that were made um, back at the start of the pandemic, if you try to put yourself back in early 2020, there was so much uncertainty, um, the healthcare system was suffering. And so the decision to ask people to stay home, to get money out quickly was a sound one under the circumstances. It now comes with the need to identify that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the back end. And so hopefully, um, that will happen. But I think looking forward, um, two of our recommendations were around getting real-time payroll information from businesses and also real-time revenue information. Not only would that make it easier should we need to have a similar response to a 
health crisis in the future, but we would help with so many other um, income support programs or other support programs that the government puts out and also just improve the overall tax system. So I'm hoping that we learn from that lesson that if we start change in the front, we have to do some work on the back end, but that we start planning for the future by laying some good foundations and getting real-time information. Karen Hogan, good to speak with you again. Thank you for that. It's great to be here. Thank you. And that is our program for this Friday evening. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us tonight and this week. We'll see you again tomorrow.